Hi everyone. This is Dr. Vinayak Senthil, faculty from uh, Speed Institute. And today we're going to discuss on INISET 2021 July paper on surgery and the surgery answer discussion. My opinion on looking at the question, all the questions, uh, I feel this time the surgery questions are very easy. They're very straightforward. And uh, I could see almost three to four questions which are direct repeat from last year meet, last year in his set and, uh, and few from the neat exams. So all those students uh, from speed who have attended the classes uh, in online and also in the app, in speed learning app, and uh, they have made almost all the questions correct. And uh, to discuss each and every question in detail, uh, we'll go ahead with the questions and we look into the answers. So I'm basically a, a cardiothoracic surgeon and completed my graduation in Madras Medical College in Chennai and did my medicine in Kilpok Medical College in Chennai. And founder and managing director and chairman of Speed Medical Institute and Speed Group of Hospitals and Medical Village. Let us go ahead with the classes uh, in surgery and discussion on INISET 2021. The first question reads, inflation during laparoscopy is done with the help of which instrument? It's a simple and a straightforward question. The answer for this question will be uh, various needle. And uh, you can see the picture of a various needle here. And uh, and there are two techniques to do create a pneumoperitoneum before laparoscopy. One is a closed technique, another is open technique. Various needle technique is a closed technique. They can ask you in the next exam. Various needle technique is a closed technique. And when you use an open technique, the cannula that you use is called Hassan's cannula. You use what is called Hassan's cannula. That is for a open technique. Now. What is the most common gas that is used to create pneumoperitoneum? All of you know that it is carbon dioxide because it is easily available. It is cost effective and it gets completely absorbed and it gets completely eliminated and does not support uh, combustion. And so that explosion does not happen uh, inside the abdomen when you use carbon dioxide. Correct? So this is about to create a pneumoperitoneum and a virus needle technique is a, a closed uh, technique to create pneumoperitoneum. Yeah, so you can see this picture and uh, 2 mm or 2 to 4 mm maximum and a small incision is made just below the umbilicus or above the umbilicus and, and you use this various needle and, uh, and you go through the linea alba and as you go through the linea alba there will be uh, an uh, initial resistance and you the pressure you will push in and then, and there will be a final giveaway as you push it. That means you have pierced the uh, sheath and then you have gone into the peritoneum. And then you have to test whether you have gone in, into the peritoneal cavity. A few drops of saline in a syringe you can put in as it goes through easily. And then you can start insufflating with the tubing that you have. You can see here. You can see here. And then uh, the carbon dioxide. Uh, goes inside the abdomen and as you achieve the pressure close to 10 to 12 liters and in an abdomen in, in an adult abdomen then you have created an adequate space for you to go ahead and do the surgery so this is uh, about a very needle technique for creating a closed pneumoperitoneum now question number two a patient underwent uh, cholecystectomy three days ago and had abdominal pain in the post-operative period and patient had tachycardia, WBC count is 11,000 and ultrasound evaluation is done. There is a collection of uh, 5 into 5 centimeter in the right hypochondrium. What is the next step in the management? So the next step in the management, uh, definitely the options were observation, open exploration, pigtail drainage of ultrasound guided and ERCP. The right answer should be abscess anywhere has to be drained. Abscess anywhere in the body has to be drained and definitely uh, subdiaphragmatic abscess or abscess in the hepatorenal pouch or Rudolfan Morrison's pouch definitely will require a drainage. And a collection like this in the CT scan and then uh, under ultrasound, this is a CT, a CT picture, 
and you can either do an ultrasound guided or ct guided uh, insertion of a pigtail catheter and uh, so that whatever the drainage whatever the collection could be drained through the pigtail catheter so you can see the pigtail catheter here in I mean in situ and that will drain uh, all the collections so most often uh, following cholecystectomy there could be a post cholecystectomy collection and if not uh, for a drain and if there would have been a drain and uh, drain would have definitely uh, i mean drained all those collections would have been there but if not a drain because most of the surgeons do not uh, put a drain for a uncomplicated cholecystectomy so if only a, a complicated difficult resection and the pyemia uh, i mean uh, or collection of a pus empyema so on those situations or the rubin uh, dissection was difficult bleeding was there so if you have expected a bile duct injury only then routine drains are uh, put post operatively uh, i mean after the surgery so that you expect post operative drainage following cholecystectomy or a straight forward cases you don't put in a drain in those situations in case there is a collection following a surgery then if you could document through uh, imaging then it, it has to be drained and if significant it has to be definitely drained and they will ask you questions like this what questions they will ask you because these are spaces in the abdomen they can ask you what is the most common site of collection of uh, abscess in the peritoneal cavity the most common site of collection of abscess in the peritoneal cavity will be pelvic pelvic space and most often it could be drained perrectally and they can ask you following a uh, most common site following upper abdominal surgery following an upper abdominal surgery uh, where does it get collected it gets collected um, under the right hemidiaphragm right hemidiaphragm it gets collected number 3 and most common uh, site of collection during uh, a pelvic surgery following a pelvic surgery uh, and lower abdominal surgery then the answer again will be pelvic space okay because pelvis is the most common overall site for intraperitoneal abscess because it is the most dependent space uh, in the peritoneal cavity so uh, you need to remember this so and at another space they will most often ask you is what is the name of the lesser sac the name of the lesser sac the name of the lesser sac is the left subhepatic space left subhepatic space and here the question often asked in entrance probably you can expect in the neat and posterior rupture of the stomach uh, the collection gets into the lesser sac or uh, in case of uh, acute pancreatitis pseudocyst of pancreas can get collected in the lesser sac and the most common site of uh, gastric cancer relapse is lesser sac this is a left subhepatic space okay so this is about the collection in the hepatorenal pouch uh, post cholecystectomy collection third question a patient with a multiple uh, cholelithiasis with the cbd diameter of 12 mm and serum bilirubin 0.8 looks normal alkaline phosphatase is increased 380 and gtt is five times of normal and what will be the next step in the management see here here is a patient with cholelithiasis and uh, alkaline phosphatase is increased that means there could be cholelithiasis as well there have been stones in the cbd and uh, having imaged Uh, this question is a little tricky see having imaged the gallbladder it's been i mean the gallbladder uh, has stones and if they say gallbladder has stones then if it would have been an ultrasound it would have been done and uh, then you would have known that the 12 mm is about the dia of cbd then it has missed or it is not able to see or visualize the cbd the stones in the cbd because some kind of obstruction is there that to cause uh, uh, such an increase in alkaline phosphatase but you could see that the patient is not jaundiced because the bilirubin is looking normal so it's tricky i mean suggestive of obstruction but it is not fully suggestive of an obstruction because uh, the bilirubin is normal so the right answer is because the next step in the management of this patient uh, would have been definitely mrcp to look into what uh, what is that is causing this problem so magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography mrcp would be the appropriate answer for this question and if the patient would have been jaundiced I mean bilirubin would have been increased then definitely uh, you would have gone to better ercp because ercp would have an advantage of not only imaging but will also you can do a therapeutic intervention by doing a sphincterotomy and if you want you can do a stent also to bring down 
uh, the below ribbon. So, I mean, so that depends I mean, on the parameters given in the question, correct? So, MRCP would be the ideal answer for a given question like this. And if you could see the picture of an MRCP, I have it here for you. And you can beautifully see the biliary radical and intrahepatic biliary radical and an extrahepatic biliary radical. Here you're able to see, visualize a stone here and able to see the pancreatic duct. See all beautifully uh, seen and visualized in an MRCP. So that give you an exact anatomy, right? Exact anatomy about the entire, uh, I mean, uh, hepatobiliary radicals, correct? So that will help you to uh, definitely uh, to look into whether stones are there uh, in the gallbladder or stones are there in the CBD, how much the dilatation is there in the extrahepatic, extrahepatic biliary radical and also in the intrahepatic biliary radical. Understood? Okay. So, in case they ask you, uh, what will be the best investigation of choice for post uh, cholecystectomy syndrome? Yet another question can be asked. What will be the best investigation for post cholecystectomy syndromes? The answer would be ERCP. Yes, answer would be ERCP. So ERCP is both diagnostic and therapeutic. For a given question, MRCP looks the best answer. Now, a female patient with a lump in the right breast, upper quadrant, 4 to 3 centimeter, axillary lymph node is negative, uh, mammograph reveals uh, Birage 4, patient underwent breast conservative surgery, and histopathological examination reveals uh, ductal carcinoma in situ with high grade. What will be the next management? See, the question is very simple. I mean, there's a big story given in this question. But ultimately, this patient has undergone breast conservative surgery. Okay. Among the options available here, yes, the best answer uh, for this, I mean, uh, will be adjuvant RT. I'll tell you a very simple logic here. Leave alone whatever given in the parameters in the question. There are two things which are very important in these parameters. One is breast conservative surgery. Understand. Breast conservative surgery. All patients who undergo breast conservative surgery should undergo post-op RT, correct? Post-operative radiotherapy is must, both to the chest and the drainage area. <laughs> Irrespective of anything, I'm telling you. Irrespective of anything. It's because 4 into 3 centimeter axillary lymph node is negative and uh, this patient has undergone a breast conservative surgery. So all patients who undergo breast conservative surgery should undergo post-operative radiotherapy to the chest and drainage area. Very simple, right? So the answer becomes very straightforward here. And, and the additional point that it tells you is uh, uh, ductal uh, carcinoma in situ with high grade. And uh, th this is a uh, little uh, disturbing because the lump itself is written to 4 into 3 centimeter. And... Uh, when you look into uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, if they have given us this as a, a pathological observation, or it could be a ductal carcinoma invasive, not otherwise specific, whatever it might be, it's a malignancy. So, irrespective of uh, this histopathological finding, this patient should undergo a radiotherapy. Very simple. Understood? Yes. So, in exam, breast conservative surgery is a very important topic. They can keep asking you, what are the contraindications? They'll, they'll ask you, what are the indications and what are the contraindications for uh, breast conservative surgery? So, it is very, very simple that uh, contraindications should be known first. So, if you know the contraindications, and definitely you will know the indications as well. So, uh, the breast conservative surgery, the contraindications will be multifocal, uh, multicentric, uh, bilateral, uh, high-grade, High grade, uh, poorly differentiated, high grade, poorly differentiated. And you don't ask me, sir, in the exam, uh, it has come as high grade uh, in the question because this the, the surgery has already decided to go ahead with the breast conservative surgery and it is a post of uh, finding. Probably uh, it was not a finding in a true cut biopsy or a pathological finding before the surgery. Uh, I mean, high grade, poorly differentiated. And uh, it will be previously uh, operated and uh, previously uh, irradiated and uh, pregnancy uh, if not terminated. Central quadrant breast cancer, central quadrant breast cancer. And uh, if it had been a breast cancer like inflammatory, inflammatory uh, breast cancer, Yes, or the tumor size, tumor size 
more than 4 cm with axillary lymph nodes positive. So, these are contraindications to do a breast conservative surgery and all this 1 to 10 becomes indication, all those contraindications becomes indication to do MRM of patty. Modified radical mastectomy by patty. Understood? So, this is in short to tell you about something about breast conservative surgery. The types of breast conservative surgery are lumpectomy, tumorectomy, tilectomy or quadrantectomy, segmentectomy, void local excision. So, all these are uh, types of uh, breast conservative surgery. Okay, the size of a, a green color cannula. See, this is a straight repeat. Uh, this is a Pakka straight uh, repeat of uh, last year uh, INISET exam and the uh, answer is also straight of 18 gauge. Now, you can see the sizes. Red will be 14, gray will be 16 and um, 17 will be white and green will be 18, red will be 20 and uh, blue will be 22 and yellow will be 24. Okay, so it's very, very uh, clear of this question. Identify the urinary crystals uh, shown in this picture. So it is very, very clear. It looks like envelope, right? It looks like an envelope. So it is nothing but calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate looks like envelope. And they can also ask you, and uh, which has sharp edges, surface in gross. And that is also calcium oxalate. And this is also called Jackstone calculus. This is also called Jackstone calculus. And this will cause uh, trauma. This will cause trauma as the stone uh, has to come down via the kidney, via the ureter into the bladder. And as it travels down the ureter, it can cause injury to the ureter. And it can cause tear of the mucosa, ureteric mucosa, and it can cause bleeding. They'll ask you which stone most commonly cause hematuria. Again, the answer will be calcium oxalate. The most common calculus in KUB, calcium oxalate. And calcium oxalate are radio opaque or radiolucent stone, radio opaque. See, what is the most common infecting organism? E. coli. So this is how they keep asking you questions. And nothing new, and definitely they can ask you. So calcium oxalate looks like envelope. And if they ask you coffin lid appearance, it will be the struvite, uh, or I mean struvite is a triple phosphate calculus, calcium, ammonia, magnesium phosphate calculus. And this is the stone that is formed in uh, alkaline urine. Uh, and the most common infecting organism will be proteus, urea splitting organism, stag on calculus, all this, all this for unsilent calculus. Yes, it's a large calculus, mostly be asymptomatic. And uric acid will be a uh, rhomboid in shape. And cysteine calculus, you know, hexagonal crystals. Yes, and the cysteine calculus will be hexagonal crystals. And uh, they will ask you, I mean, uh, which will turn yellowish green on exposure to air? It is cysteine calculus. Which calculus are difficult to fragment by ESWL? Cysteine calculus. Yes, so those are the questions which are asked. And uric acid calculus is formed in which urine? Acidic urine. Cysteine calculus is formed in which urine? Acidic urine. I mean, is the uric acid calculus radiopaque or radiolucent? They are radiolucent. They are seen as a filling defect in uh, intravenous urography. And they form an important different diagnosis for what? For urothelial tumors. Correct? And so they ask you question. Question number seven. Identify the hernia shown below. See, it's a, no doubt it's a diaphragmatic hernia. And uh, the minute we say diaphragmatic hernia, whether it is Bogdalek or Morgagnian. Correct? See, that depends on the location of the hernia. See, this picture in actual uh, exam, I'm uh, giving both the pictures to you. And whatever you have seen in the exam, that will be, uh, you can mark that as an answer. Here, you are able to see a sac like this. And this picture lateral very clearly shows that this is a posterior in location. And this is onto the left and the posterior. So posterior lateral onto the left will be Bogdalek. Will be Bogdalek. Anterior medial onto the right will be Morgagnian. If picture like this would have been there, 
then the answer would be Bogdalek. If the picture has to be like a Morgagnian, it has to be like this. A uh, hernial sac you are able to see and uh, it is on to the right. And here you are able to see a sac in the anterior aspect. See that? This is the vertebra. This is the vertebra. And, and here is the sternum. So, substernal location in the anterior aspect, in the anterior, along the anterior mediastinum, you are able to see this, this is a Morgagnian hernia. So, Morgagnian hernia will be on mostly on to the right, most common location, and anteriorly placed. Okay, substernal location. And this hernia happens in the Larry space. I can ask you this Larry space. Larry space. With the hernia happens in the Larry space is Morgagnian. Yes, pleuroperitoneal canal defect. Persistent pleuroperitoneal canal defect is Bogdalak. The most common type of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The most common congenital diaphragmatic hernia will be Bogdalak. And what is the investigation of choice? Antenatal ultrasound. Antenatal ultrasound will give you intrathoracic peristalsis. Intrathoracic peristalsis. Understood? So, this is about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The next picture, angle between skin and needle when performing an intermittent suture. What will be the angle? It's a very simple and straightforward question. The answer is 90 degrees. The answer is 90 degrees. Now, you can, you can look into this explanation. The needle should always penetrate the skin at 90 degree angle, which minimizes the size of the entry wound and promotes the aversion of skin edges. And the needle should be inserted 1 to 3 mm from the wound edge, depending on the skin. Now, I'll show you a picture. You look into this picture. Now, it is very, very clearly seen that it's a clean cut wound and the needle should go straight at 90 degrees. Yes, 90 degrees. Okay. Now, three year old child, mother notices a huge abdominal swelling, balatable, history of hematuria, which is resolved before two days. And uh, balatable abdominal swelling, what are the investigations to be done? See, which swellings are balatable, renal swellings are balatable. So what are the investigations to be done here? For this child, the investigation to be done are PET CT and contrast NNCT. Looking at the age and the presentation, and this is a tumor from the kidney because uh, the presence of hematuria is there and, uh, and mother notices and uh, and it will be typically of a Wilms tumor. So Wilms tumor, nephroblastoma. The Wilms tumor is a nephroblastoma and uh, this is mostly, uh, as mostly it is asymptomatic. Asymptomatic abdominal swelling diagnosed when the mother is bathing the child and you see a I mean, huge uh, swelling and we brought to the notice uh, of the consultant. So, uh, uh, contrast in NCT will help to identify and locate uh, the lesion and uh, a PET CT will definitely help to look into the distant metastasis because the most common site of distant metastasis in Wilms tumor is lungs. Understand this. So, these two investigations are pretty important and for all the stages of Wilms tumor, we do surgery. We do a nephrectomy, then we do staging to plan for adjuvant uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So, uh, Wilms tumor are predominantly operated and so that uh, avoid uh, biopsy, a needle biopsy and urinary VMA levels are not required for the reasons that I mean they don't produce, these tumors don't produce any hormones or any mediators uh, I mean for you to measure uh, I mean VMA levels, it is not required. And if you suspect and the age is not supporting that, something like a pheochromocytoma, then probably these mediators might be important for this uh, patient. This is not important. The two investigations which I would prefer is uh, contrast and CT and PET CT would be the appropriate answer for this question. Okay. So you, you are able to see a huge, see that, see, see uh, you'll be able to see a mass in the, in the child and the child can have hematuria and also have hypertension and could have I mean other syndromes associated with um, uh, Wilms tumor and Albeck with Wittemann syndrome and can be a uh, Wager syndrome, Denistra syndrome, all this could be associated with a uh, child with Wilms tumor. And uh, I an mean, ultrasound will be the initial investigation of choice 
and contrast uh, CT uh, will be uh, help to differentiate from other tumor, especially in neuroblastoma, one of the most common malignancy in children. And, and liver metastasis and predominantly the lung is the most common site of metastasis can also be documented, but an abdominal CT can give you whether liver metastasis are there or not, or the PET CT will be important for you to locate the lung metastasis. And chest X-ray as a baseline for pulmonary metastasis. If anything is suspected, then you go for PET CT. And the MRI will be the uh, one can give some additional information uh, if CT uh, is not available. Understood? So this is all thing that you need to know about the Wilms tumor. Okay. So it is attached to the kidney. There's a reason why uh, the child has hematuria. Okay, hematuria is one finding in this question that differentiates from neuroblastoma or the diagnosis could have been even neuroblastoma as well. Yes, so associated congenital anomalies and genitourinary anomalies. If it's in which uh, tumor in which uh, the IVC, then there could be chances of varicocele and hypertension is also seen. Okay, in this child in 25% of cases. The next question is patient presence with renal swelling with the thickened walls and the septations are seen and type 3 and type 3 and uh, and what does it what does it mean it it means to me it's the renal cyst correct why it means to a renal cyst because this is the current bosnai classification class 1 uh, hairline thin wall no septa no calcification type 2 there are one and two subtypes uh, there are few thin septations with or without perceived enhancements, fine calcification, thin septation and fine calcification. And uh, second type is homogeneously high attenuated masses less than or equal to 3 cm with, with sharply marginated and do not enhance. And uh, 2F and 2F has also has two subtypes. One will be minimally thickened, more than few thin septa with or without perceived um, enhancement that may be thick or nodular calcification. Two will be intrarenal non-enhancing hyperattenuating renal masses more than three centimeter. And type three will be thickened or irregular walls or septa with measurable enhancement. And four will be soft tissue component. Yes, with nodules with measurable enhancement. Understood? Now, when you look into the uh, this picture, when you look into this picture, it will clearly show that type 1 cyst has 0% risk of malignancy, type 2 0% risk of malignancy, and 2F, yes, has 5% risk of malignancy, and 3 has 50% risk of malignancy, and 4 has 100% risk of malignancy. This is about Bosnoi classification, tells you about the types of cyst in the kidney. A boy with a perirenal injury came to the emergency department on examination. Blood present at the meatus has not passed urine and bladder not full. The next step in the management uh, scenario will be. See, the minute the minute you get a question like this, it's very, very, very clear. And you see uh, blood at the meatus and the perineal injury. And it has not passed urine. See, this is a classical uh, Triad. So the answer will be wait for the bladder to be filled and, and have an originate to urge to urinate. See, understand this is a typical bulbar uh, bulbar urethral injury. See, bulbar urethral injury, the triad is blood at the external urethral meatus, blood at the external urethral meatus, and acute retention of urine. Acute retention of urine. And uh, number three will be a perineal hematoma perineal hematoma. Now, once the bladder is full, the ideal will be to go for SPC, suprapubic cystostomy. So here, if the bladder is full, this is supposed to be, the bladder is supposed to be full here, but I don't know why the bladder is given as not full. If I've been full, I would have gone for this option primarily, because this would have been an ideal. And you should never put in a folis here, understand this. Yes, and you should never wait and send them home. This is also wrong. And this is also wrong. Folies will give a false passage. Why will give a false passage? Look into this picture. See, this is a... See, you would have something have a rupture here. Yes, 
and uh, the bulbar urethral injury, the, the, the force would have been from here, correct? And, uh, and you see the blood and the external urethral meatus, the patient would have a perineal hematoma. Yes, and at this given situation, this hematoma could have an uh, acute retention of urine and bladder will eventually become full. Begin the question is empty, but eventually become full, then put an SPC and wait. And then wait for 14 days and do a descending cystourethrogram. And then you see what happens to the passage. And uh, if it has uh, I mean, have become resolved, then probably you can pull out the catheter. And, uh, and if it is not resolved, then you have to plan for erythroplasty. Understood? So Foley's catheter you are not supposed to give. You should put only an SPC. Suprapubic cystostomy. Understood? Now, you, you would have seen in Bailey and Lau a typical picture like this. Yes? You have seen a typical picture like, like this. Man falling on a manhole. Straddle injury. Right? Man falling on a manhole. Yes? What kind of injury? Dung, it will get hit. Yes? At the perineum. And you can see the blood will exit with the perineal hematoma and acute retention of urine. Okay? Very good. So, man falling astride. Bulbar urethral injury. They can ask you, the most common site of urethral injury, bulbar urethra. The most common site of urethral injury will be bulbar urethra. The best investigation to localize parathyroid tissue. The right answer given is system may be scan. System may be scan. See, actually, uh, Schwartz textbook of surgery says, the best way to localize parathyroid gland is an experienced parathyroid surgeon doing a cervical exploration looking directly. But after the, for the given uh, options, system may be scan is the best answer here. Now, I'll show you a picture of a system may be scan. See, the, this is a picture of system may be scan. This is a thyroid and this is a parathyroid. And this is a parathyroid adenoma. And this is an iodine scan. You can see the entire thyroid is taken by the iodine. And if you do a subtraction, digital subtraction, and you'll be able to, and you'll be able to see, uh, is there any uh, a thyroid nodule and a parathyroid adenoma? And uh, I mean, in, in this picture, you're able to see a nodule in the thyroid and also a parathyroid adenoma. Understood? Now, I'll show you one more picture. And this is a system may be scan where you're able to see an enhancement happening in the, in the lower down in the neck in the mediastinum. And this is an ectopic parathyroid gland and an ectopic parathyroid gland. So, system may be scan is an investigation of choice uh, to localize parathyroid and parathyroid pathology. Okay? Next question. A patient presented uh, with a painless hard enlargement uh, of the testis and LDH values are raised and what is the next step? So it is a very simple, it's a suspected testicular cancer because LDH values are increased and it's a painless hard enlargement. It's a straightforward question. The answer will be high inguinal arcadectomy. See, the minimum biopsy, they'll ask you, the minimum biopsy. Yes, or the only form of biopsy is an high inguinal arcadectomy. A trans needle scrotal biopsy should never be done. A trans needle scrotal biopsy should be never be done because it will cause spillage and, and it will I mean violate the principal surgical, I mean oncological principles of surgery. Okay. So it is a high inguinal arcadectomy, it should be done, and then you should subject it for histopathological examination. It can be a seminomandus tumor or a non-seminomandus tumor. Understood? And once you have done uh, high inguinal arcadectomy and it has come in as a malignancy, then you should go along like a protocol, like they can ask you a step, what are the steps? Now, high inguinal arcadectomy. And if it is positive and HP says uh, it is malignant, and then you have to go for a CT abdomen, okay, to look for the para aortic lymph nodes. Para aortic lymph nodes to see whether the size is less than two centimeter um, or more than uh, two centimeter or more than two to five centimeter or more than five centimeter. Okay, so you need, you need to see what is the enlargement of parioidic lymph nodes. Understood? Then once the parioidic lymph nodes are documented, then you also do tumor markers. Yes, tumor markers. So this is how you work out uh, about uh, if you suspect a hard testis and enlargement, painless enlargement of the testis. Okay, 14 question. Triage is defined as, triage is defined as to sort out. See, you will be able to see in this picture, the red is 1, 2 will be orange and 3 will be yellow, 4 will be green. 
It says one is to resuscitate and, and two says urgent, three says less urgent, four says not urgent. And this is very, very, very important. And one is very, very important for you to should know. Obstructed airway could be a strider, SPO2 less than 80, respiratory rate more than 35 or less than 8, heart rate more than 130, BP systolic should be less, will be less than 80, and GCS less than or equal to 8. Understood? And the red is emphasized more again here. And uh, you need to see what kind of breathing is a patient conscious or unconscious and respiration. What is the rate? Is it more than 30 or a perfusion? Uh, how, is, how about the perfusion? Are you able to feel the radial pulse? And is the capillary refilling? What happens? And what about the mental status? So able to or unable to follow the commands. Understood? So this is about to sort out. A triage is a term derived from French verb. Yes, tire means sort out, sort out to choose. In this process by which the patients are classified according to the type and urgency of their condition to get the right patient to the right place at the right time, the right care provider. Understood? Okay. The most common cause of post-operative admission in a daycare surgery. Okay. The right answer for this question is bleeding. Bleeding is the right answer. And uh, all the re uh, recent studies have very, very clearly said the percentage of admission in our unit is comparable to the ambulatory surgery units in other countries. And um, vomiting was not the major cause of admission. The principal cause of admission were hemorrhage and pain. Infection is a cause of admission following ambulatory surgery. Gathering data on admission due to infection presents a challenge as this complication appears after the discharge and subsequent treatment in many cases takes place in central distinct from the original ambulatory surgery. Okay. Ambulatory surgery unit. So the right answer for this question will be bleeding. Understood? And it is very, very important. COVID-19 positive patient requiring hospitalization can be planned for surgery after how many weeks? The right answer for this question will be six weeks. But actually, when you look into the classification of American Society of Anesthesiologists, it is very clear, four weeks will be the time for asymptomatic COVID positive and six weeks for the symptomatic patient and eight to 10 weeks for the symptomatic patient who is diabetic and immunocompromised or hospitalized and 12 weeks for a patient who was there in ICU. Very important. See, four weeks for asymptomatic, six weeks for symptomatic, eight to 10 weeks for patient who are symptomatic, either diabetic or immunocompromised, and 12 weeks for ICU patient, correct? Understood? Okay, so there we go. So, so there are 16 questions which were there in surgery that have been collected through the sources from students and internet and uh, and we have discussed all those questions questions as mentioned earlier were simple and straightforward and uh, to look into the learning of surgery and you can uh, subscribe speed learning app and uh, you have uh, the surgery being discussed at length and breadth and i wish to see you uh, for learning further for in speed learning app if you require and I wish all of you uh, all the success in the upcoming NEET exam. Thank you once again and best wishes to all of you.